Salto started in this way in that uh, I'd come back to UCT in about 1967 having finished my thesis, uh, which was on mine wages really. Uh, and that had been published as a book in 1972 and in the same time I had been working on migrant labor and traveling around the country and I published a book on that also in 72-73. So uh, those, were, those were done but it was becoming apparent to me that if I was going to be a full-time teacher, which I always was, teaching Economics 101 for many years, um, that I would need some, some administrative help essentially and that wasn't available in a big department with one secretary, I mean she didn't have time. So I decided I'd need to raise some money uh, to get some admin help and then to, to build from there. Uh, the difficulty was that um, you couldn't raise money from anybody unless you had a unit that would receive the money but UCT wouldn't let me uh, start a unit unless I had some money. So it was a bit of a catch-22 situation. And then um, when I took my first sabbatical leave in 1973, um, I had a conversation with Alec Bahrain, who at that time was working for Anglo-American. We met in England and I explained my dilemma. And he said, oh, well, let's see what we can do. And he talked to, um, uh, to somebody in, uh, in the chairman's fund. Um, and they called me up to Joburg and said, look, we hear that you might want to start something. And if you do, here is some money to do research. You know, you might think it's a little bit odd um, that Anglo-American should be offering me research money. But I think that they felt that the uh, previous research had been accurate and that, that was the critical point. And so they were very, uh, uh, very generous. Michael O'Dowd was behind all of that and he was a firm believer in an independent um, unit uh, in Anglo giving money for education and so on and for, and for research. And so we were the beneficiaries of that for the first seven years of, Anglo of uh, Salary's life. That was interesting because when I started this thesis way back, um, I had a grand idea I was going to do something on the economics of discrimination. But what did that actually mean? How are you going to do that? So I went off to the States because I thought, well, the Americans have been dealing with the economics of discrimination and I'll learn from them. Well, I met Gary Becker and read his famous book on uh, the economics of discrimination. And the more I read it, the more I realized that it was completely useless as far as I was concerned for analyzing the South African scene, which is quite different from the American one. Uh, for a start, the people being discriminated against were a huge majority in this country, whereas in the States it was a much smaller minority. So I had to rethink what was my basic question uh, in order to get at that whole issue of discri economic discrimination. And I, it took me about 18 months to find the question. And, and the question was, what are wages of whites and blacks in the gold mining industry? What are they? And why are whites on average earning so much more than blacks? And why is that gap widening? Now, once I'd got my question sorted out, uh, then it's just a matter of collecting the data. Well, easier said than done because in those days the mining industry wasn't letting any information out about mine wages, especially black mine wages. So that took many months uh, living in Joburg and working out how to get it. And I won't go into that now, but it's an interesting story. Anyway, finally I did get the information and then I could go and do the analysis. And once one had a look at mine wages between very clearly between 1911 and 19, when did my thesis end? 66, but let's say 1970, and going back into the 1890s, that the gap between uh, white and black was enormous, was about 11 to 1. The average white was about 11 times the average black. Uh, and whites are, you're including the, the, the uh, manager of the mine and everybody. 
Uh, but that started widening in about 1936-37, and so by 1971 it was 20 to 1. Why, what's going on? And black wages seem, if anything, to have decreased. They were certainly static for the first half more of the uh, 20th century. How did they do that? Well, by the very simple, not so simple, but by the exercise of what we economists call monopsony, where you create a single buyer, that the Chamber of Mines hired all the labor for every mine. So you had no competitive bidding between mines for labor. And so in order to maintain their monopsony, one of the rules was that you could only employ labor hired by the Chamber of Mines and you could only pay wages so there was a maximum permissible average. And then you kept, and so wages were kept static for 60 years, 70 years, through that, through that technique. And it, essentially, it was building a labor monopsony, which was a single buyer of labor. We said, let's start a research unit where we've got support for this. And I was lucky enough to be able to persuade Dudley Horner, who you never met because he died a couple of years ago, Dudley Horner to come from Joburg. Uh, to work as the sort of uh, anchor of salary. He was wonderful and we complemented each other quite well. Uh, and so anything that salary has ever done was as much him as anybody else. And so we had this little unit of uh, really two men and a dog uh, in a tiny little office up on the campus and then gradually we got a bit more space. We said to ourselves, well now what, we've done migrant labor, we've done gold mines for the moment, um, what do we not know anything about? And the answer is uh, farm labor. Absolutely nothing about farm labor. Now going back to 1950 or so, one third of black South Africans lived in the towns, one third lived in the Bondi stars, and one third lived on, on so-called white owned farms. But we knew nothing about it, nobody knew anything. I mean, Tax, uh, tax collectors were driven off the farms and so on. So we said, well, let's have a conference. And we'll invite anybody who'd like to come, whether they're government or farmers or farm workers or academics, to come and tell us what they know about farm labor. And that's actually a very interesting book. I mean, we published it in 1976, 77. And it's one of the few books, even now, one of the few books in South Africa that tells you what was going on in the farms then. Wages, living conditions, that was our focus. That was our focus. And we worked on the basis that the special branch could leave us alone because all we were doing was collecting facts and figures and what was so horrible about that. And we were doing it in a university environment. Right at the beginning of the 1980s, uh, we were thinking, but we were by no means the only ones, we were thinking, well, why don't we revisit the Carnegie uh, inquiry into, into poverty in the 1930s, which was uh, Blanca Armuda, wi uh, white poverty. And then in February 1980, in came David Hood, who was the international director of Carnegie. And he'd been to us a couple of times to sort of say, could we advise him about this or that, and who he should go and give money to, and so, but they'd never given us any money. So this time we thought, well, we're going to uh, talk to Hood and see if we can't get some money out of him. So I can still remember talking to him up uh, in the office, and we said, look, how about Connie giving, giving us some support now? Because we lived uh, on the smell of an oil rag. We only set up with five years limits. We said we'll run for five years, collect our money, then if we got no more money, we stop. Um, so we were always on our toes wondering about where our next meal was going to come from. And um, so I said to David, look, uh, how about Carnegie helping us? Yes, he said we'd be quite interested in that. How about you guys doing the um, what would they call the Sullivan Code. Now this was a whole process whereby American firms were being held to um, standards that they must do this, this, this and this. And so David Hood thought it would be a very fine thing if we would monitor the Sullivan Code, that the firm, American firms had signed the Sullivan Code. 
And I said to him, no, 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 that's not our, not our job, that's your job. You Americans have got to work out whether your firms are behaving properly or not. It's not, not my job. What we would be interested in is something like the Carnegie thing. Um, and he said, oh, well, Alan Piper happens to be in town. This is now the, the, the president of the Carnegie. Let's go and have breakfast with him. So we went to have breakfast with him. And he said, oh, that's an interesting idea. I said, you know, we thought we could have another Carnegie inquiry, this time including everybody. Uh, and of course, the politics of this was brilliant because it made it difficult for the Nats to be opposed to a Carnegie inquiry because the first one had set them on their feet uh, for all kinds of reasons. You can talk about that at great length. Um, so they said, well, we, but I said, I'm going on sabbatical leave now and I'm not doing anything till I come back. He said, this is fine. You go away and think about all of this and we'll give you a little bit of money to do that and write some proposals for us about how you think you can do this whole thing. So we spent effectively three years, uh, no, two years, um, talking before we even announced the thing publicly because the politics was incredibly sensitive. On the one hand, if we were perceived as too radical, we'd been wiped out. Uh, by the branch who just had to turn off the money or anything. On the other hand, if we were, if we were just seen as part of the white uh, setup, we would get nowhere uh, in terms of working with the community. So we had to walk that fine line and I spent a year uh, going around the country talking to everybody uh, who we thought mattered uh, in black South Africa at the time, which excluded exiles and excluded those on Robben Island, uh, to see what they thought about, could we be using American money to study poverty in South Africa and what did they think. So that was, that was time well spent. And we also did the politics of that in this sense that uh, Alan Pfeiffer went off to see people in the cabinet here and to say that this is what the Carnegie Corporation was doing and you know what the Cor Carnegie Corporation was all about. And, so. and on the other hand, I was in Oxford during that year, so I went to see my friend um, Paolo Jordan, who I'd, we'd known each other as children in the Eastern Cape, and I'd, I went to see him at his home riding a bicycle so they wouldn't be chasing. And that was, that was necessary, those kind of precautions as we learned l later. And what I said was that uh, I'm not coming to ask you guys for permission because universities don't do that, but we just wanted you to know that we're setting up this study and so on. And he said, thank you very much, I hear you. So that was important political footwork to do. Uh, in the environment, because we then managed to get through all those years, and I think the only person who went to jail for a short time was uh, Omar Bacha, and uh, the branch never closed what us down. His role, at the his role oh, Omar ran the photographs. He'd phoned me up as soon as this went public, because we went very public to, and invited everybody to participate and so on. Uh, as our best protection. And he phoned me up from Durban and said, Francis, I need, I can't remember how much it was, like 20,000 Rand or something, to do is, uh, to bring together the photographers in the country on this whole issue. I said, that sounds great, Omar, sure. But he said, uh, there won't be one starving baby in our photographs. I said, right on, go with it. I want to show the dignity of people enduring poverty. I said, that's fine, you do that. And they were terrific. I mean, we've got a book somewhere here. Um, of, uh, of those photographs. So we had the Carnegie, and, th and that was great. I mean, um, one of the really amusing bits about it was that in order to persuade Carnegie that this was a genuine thing, they wanted to get buy-in from a serious black name. Well, that was easier said than done because either they were in jail or they were in exile, and it was very difficult. But luckily, Fiki Le Bum, who had been on the island for 10 years, and then banned to the trans sky. And I knew Fix very well. We were students together. In fact, he's my son's godfather. Anyway, so I thought, let me go and talk to Fix in the trans sky and see if we can't winkle him loose from Matanzima's clutches because he had sufficient links with Matanzima to be able to say to Matanzima, give me a passport. 
So he got a passport from Matanzima, which enabled him to fly to Johannesburg International, as it was in those days, where I met him, and we flew together to, uh, to New York. So he was walking down Fifth Avenue, New York, at, uh, yeah, New York at a time when he was unable to get to East London. I mean, it was a crazy, crazy time. But he could come to Carnegie and say to them, no, we back this. There has never been any guarantee for so long as I've been here that everything would work out right. It's always uh, a gamble. You look at the future, you look at the future in 1970, and my God, how can we ever survive? 1980, 1990, now, you know, it's the same thing. So to that extent, South Africa is very much a work in progress of where, and I do believe this, where the modern world is going. Because the modern world at a macro level is having to do with huge wealth and huge poverty, and they think they don't have anything to do with each other, but they're dead wrong. Uh, and we do have to do, we do have to work out things here so that uh, I still choose to live here. There are bits that we can fix, like corruption. I mean, that needs fixing. Quick. Um, but how are we really going to fix the enormous gap between rich and poor in this country? This is not at all clear when it has taken 150 years to create this, that distribution of wealth, that distribution of education. What I think we do need to do is to sort of be very uh, hard-headed and say these are the things that need to happen and now we've got to happen, now we've got to do them. I mean, to let our education run to rot like it has is mad.